Podcasting is more than just talking. It's listening. BSing with Bob Schmidt. Entrepreneur, business leader, and author Angela Mueller joining me. Angela wrote the book 2020 Vision for Your Life, Overcoming Obstacles and Finding Your Focus. Angela, thanks a lot for joining me today. What's the book about? Understanding where you want to be in life. And I think that um, a lot of times we get so caught up on what's not going right and what's held us back and the things that have gone wrong that we just focus on the obstacles that keep us from where we're, where we're trying to get in light. And so the book really encourages the reader to really try and focus on where they want to be, to be and to take steps to get to where they want to be in life, not worrying so much about the steps and the ABCs of how they're going to get there, but really focusing in on where they want to be and from there um, and really having that in sight can help them to, um, to take little baby steps, if you will, to get to where they want to be and not so much focus on where they are. So what made you decide that it was time for Angela to write a book? Well, I actually I wanted to write a book about uh, 2020 vision for your, I'm sorry, yeah, 2020 vision for your business. I um, am a business major, and I love all things business entrepreneur, as you mentioned, and um, I just got this epiphany one night that if your life is all jacked up, then how can you have a successful business? And so from there, I started taking notes and jotting things down, and um, when I shared the idea with several people, they were encouraged by it, and I wanted to go ahead and and self-publish, and that's what I did. So are you a business major, or do you run a business then? I do. I uh, am what you would call a serial entrepreneur. Um, I have a technology business right now, a consulting business, and I've also um, bought, sold, and uh, created businesses in the personal care industry, uh, in the early childhood education industry, in the shipping industry. Um, I am a business major. I uh, have my master's degree in business, and I'm also finishing up a doctoral degree in organizational leadership. So I love all things business. Where did your love for business begin? When I was working, when I started working, I was I really had a knack for uh, finding pain areas in the business, and uh, my bosses didn't like that so much. Uh, so I was always trying to figure out a way to make things run better, work better, be more efficient. And when I saw that, you know, in corporate America especially, that it was kind of a dog-eat-dog world, uh, people weren't really focused on the corporate vision, if you will, but mainly their position and holding on to the place where they were. I just had a, a desire to do more and to do more for other people who wanted to start businesses and who really wanted to focus on doing something with vision. So even in my entrepreneurial roles, I like to work with business owners and I like to work on businesses that start with a real passion and really focus on how to apply strategy to that vision in order to bring that um, profitability to that passion. The big picture, how do you how do you focus in on finding the big picture of life or the big picture of uh, a business or the big picture of a brand new idea, like a a new business? Again, I like to start with what we're passionate about. Um, A lot of times we we think that might be, you know, a certain food that we like or um, something that is just pleasurable to us. But really looking at what we're passionate passionate about and finding a pain point. So that's what marketing is all, all about, really finding a pain point. Sometimes that can be within yourself or within your own household, and then really determining how you can scale that business and how that pain might apply to other people. For example, the personal care business that I started is called Temple Works. Uh, Temple Works is a a personal care business where we uh, help to make your body better. Our flagship product, Bob, which I think you might like, is called Testy Fresh. It's the only all-natural antiperspirant on the market for the male groin area. (laughs) Testy Fresh. (laughs) And and the the way that I came about, the concept was I had teenage boys. And my husband, uh, at the time, they were very active and very smelly. (laughs) And so um, my husband, uh, he would use baby powder or different products, but they turned out to maybe start chicken thigh or being uncomfortable for him when he would wear suits. You know, they would leak or create a stain in his suit. And so we created something that was, you know, simple and all natural that my kids could wear, that my husband could wear. 
And then from there, we started to market it and people started to buy it. So um, just something that, you know, is, is, is every day, something that we, we see every day that, that we think, oh, gosh, nobody would ever buy that or nobody would ever uh, believe in that idea. But you never know until you test the market and see who else has those same pains that you do. How do you market something like that? I mean, I, I get it by the name of it, but... Would I try uh-huh. it if I wouldn't have talked? If I'm not talking to you right now, and I saw that on the shelf uh-huh. as I'm walking as I'm walking through the department store, I'd look at it. I'd uh-huh. have the exact same reaction that I had when you said it to me. Uh-huh. I'd probably laugh and walk by it and think to myself, "Who in the hell would buy that?" <laughs> well, the how we market we market comically. You know, we we um, we, we we make a joke about it because it's it's a place in an area that most people don't talk about. It's very sensitive. And so when I market it, I, I try to market it mainly to couples because the guy uh, typically will not recognize that it's an issue, but the woman is like, oh yeah, you need that. And so <laughs> we use the woman to, uh, you know, to to actually break that um the, kind of that stigma, and she starts talking about it, and they're like, oh, okay. And then the fact that kids can use it as well. It's 100% natural, and, you know, being that my boys um, use it, they're football players, basketball players, they talk about it, and, you know, there's a commercial that I have online where the boys are in the commercial, and they tell their friends, hey, I smell much better when I use this product. So really <laughs> – Oh it's goodness. great locker room talk. I bet, I bet that it is. I could just picture it. Oh, yeah. It smells really nice and fresh. <laughs> and testy fresh. And believe it or not, we have competition, you know, believe it or not. And so I had to look at what our competitor was were doing and what their messaging was and how they were getting the product out there. And then we had to come up with a way, you know, really bringing it back to business we have to come up with a way to differentiate ourselves you know how are we different from our competitors you know you you would think oh my god i've never heard of this that's the common sentiment but there are competitors and a lot of times as business owners you know we forget that we have real competition out there and that we have to distinguish ourselves from those other people even in nonprofits, i i talk to um, people all the time who want to start nonprofit organizations but there's competition for for those dollars there's you know there are people who have charities there are people who have causes how are you going to make yourself stand out and make you different from the guy down the street so finding a product coming up with it writing it down you know going from point from oh yeah uh uh from that to all of a sudden some, a product on the shelf how, how do you take those steps what steps does a person take from you know that original idea to all right here's my product that I want to sell to you for me I was taught, you know, growing up that when you had an idea or something like that, we, we, we're living in an age now where people want to protect everything by uh, intellectual property and right. patents and trademarks and copy, copyrights and all of those things. But for me, uh, before I even started doing any of that, me just telling my story uh, got me into the, the, the right circle and in front of the right audience to actually have it produced. Uh, for example, um, the, the, my chemist, the person that I use to produce the product, she's actually the person that I buy my lotions from. She makes lotions. And I was just talking to her one day about this idea, and she's like, oh, my goodness, Angela, I think that's a great idea. And come to find out, she used to work for um, uh, Old Spice. She was a chemist for Old Spice for a number of years. So I told her about that. She does all natural lotions now, and she also has the background in um, male antiperspirants. So she was the perfect person for me to create the idea. Again, still telling the story. Uh, I spoke with a, um, a patent attorney. I spoke with an intellectual property attorney, you know, and they helped me and gave me some steps on a website to go to so where I could do some things on my own. And then from there, just having the passion and persistence to get it done. Um, I, you know, a lot of people don't like the idea. They think that it's something that a lot of people wouldn't like. They wouldn't buy. They don't want to talk about, which is fine. But for me, I have a tangible product, which is a lot more than most people come up with. They have an idea and they try to sell an idea, but I have an actual product because I didn't give up on myself. So, Angela, what made you drive you to that every single day? You know, you brought it up even on your answer that, you know, people have these ideas and, you know, they go and talk to their people about it. 
but that's usually as far yeah. as it goes. And I won't say that I, I feel that way every single day, Bob. I would be a liar if I did. But I have to I have to have routines. And that's what, you know, when you listen to uh, all of these millionaires and billionaires, they talk about having routines and positive self-talk and getting up in the morning and working twice as hard as everyone else. You know, I saw a quote from Mark Cuban uh, about a week ago that said, you have to work like there's someone else working 24 hours to take everything away from you. And so whenever I want to stop, where I think that, you know, I'm too tired to, to, to do another thing and this is never going to work, I have to tell myself, I have to go back to that 2020 vision. Where do I see myself and where do I want to be? So if taking this nap is not going to help me to get closer to that vision that I have for my life, then I can't take that nap right now. Have you figured out that your vision, your 2020 vision is in focus or do you find it that it's sometimes it's hard to get into focus for your, you know, for your vision? I think that sometimes it's hard to get into focus because there's so many steps between where we are now and ultimately where we want to be. And so there's a quote from the book where I say, just just concentrate on where you want to be and don't worry about how you're going to get there. When I speak to audiences, I do a little exercise, Bob, and I tell them, you know, let's say I'm going to give you an all expense paid trip for two weeks to the destination of your choice. Where would you choose? I, I would like to go to my cabin. But, you know, if it was outside of that, I, I'd like to, I don't know, huh? maybe maybe Dallas, Texas, or Honolulu, Hawaii, or New York City. You know, maybe, okay. uh, maybe, some, you know, maybe someplace like that. Okay, great. But you didn't ask me one time, how are you going to pay for it, Angela? You didn't care. All you knew is that you wanted to be maybe on the beach in Honolulu or hanging out, maybe eating some barbecue in Texas. You didn't care where I was going to get the money or how I was going to give you that, that prize. And that's why we have to look at our vision. When we decide there's a destination that we want to achieve in life, whether that be a certain amount of profit in our business, whether that be our kids going off to college, whether that be, you know, starting um, just starting a child care business, I have no idea. But whatever it is that someone wants to do and they see themselves doing, focus on that and then just start taking little steps toward it. Write down the name of the business. Write down the cost of the plane ticket. Write down the number of kids that you want to service. And then after a while, just keep taking baby steps. And before you know it, you'll be there. It seems so simple. It... I think that it is. I think that it's a simple process, but we allow obstacles to tell us you know, to dictate to us that we can't do it. So in the book, it's a really simple book, Rob. It's only 10 chapters. The first five chapters are just dedicated to obstacles that we face in our lives. Those are your past, your mistakes, being authentic, other people's opinions. And then if none of those relate to you, then more than likely it's the last chapter, which is yourself. What's the best way to market yourself? Because there's so many different avenues of marketing these days. You've got you know, terrestrial radio, you've got podcasts, you've got internet, you've got television, you've got, you know, social media, the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you properly market yourself in a day when everybody else seems to be doing your, the same thing? I mean, exactly. Just like, just like your business, you said you didn't realize that other people had that. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, uh, how do I how do I stand out from everybody else? Yeah, I think with marketing, the key is to go where your customers are, and eventually you'll find that out even if you don't know from the beginning. I find a lot of small business owners with my consulting business, they don't take the time to do market research to understand what their customer looks like and what their customer's needs are. But let's just say, for example, that someone did that and, and they decided that you know, they were going to market to a Generation Y crowd, which hangs out mainly on Instagram or on Snapchat. Um, it's important that, you know, that you do research because you can't improve what you don't measure. And so once you do the research, you start measuring the interaction that you're getting on those platforms or with that certain type of advertisement. And if it's not working, then just change it. Um, 
research is not perfect. You may think that this is the best place for you to go and this is where your your target hangs out, but it may turn out that, you know, okay, your cl- your crowd is slightly older and they're hanging out on Facebook and then you may have to change that strategy. But as a business owner, it's important to be agile and then also pay attention to what you're doing, research and then track your marketing efforts so that you know whether or not you're just spinning your wheels or if you're actually um, making money from your marketing efforts. So go where your customers are. As a serial entrepreneur, I'm assuming that you probably have come up with other product ideas that maybe weren't the uh, um, re- so refreshing as the one that you told me about earlier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> explain to me a, a failure that you've had and how you turn that failure into something on a positive side. Oh. I actually bought a business from um, a woman who was about to get a divorce. Uh, She had a courier business, local courier business here, and she just wanted to get rid of the business and move somewhere else. And I thought, oh, wow, this is great. I can get it at a good cost. And I did. I ended up buying the business from her. The business was going well. She gave me all of her contacts. Well, about six months into the business, Um, my sales started to drop and I was asking my customers why, what was going on, why are they placing less orders? Well, her husband had come back from where he was and he had started poaching all of the clients. And so um, because they had the relationship with him um, and I was the newbie, a lot of them decided to go with him. And so the way that I was able to um, combat that was to try some innovation. I got some new software. Uh, We started doing some automations, but eventually I had to sell it off to a bigger company out in the Midwest. But uh, from that, I just learned that you have to do your research, you have to do your due diligence, and you have to be prepared because there are certain things that come in business that we really have no safeguards for. And just really understand, I, I had to understand when enough was enough and when I didn't want to fight anymore. And at that point, I sold it off, but I did learn uh, from that that you have to do the due diligence up front, and, and there's always going to be something out there that you can't account for. Is it hard to come up with an exit strategy? I think it's hard for people who don't realize that an exit strategy is inevitable. Um, a lot of people want to hold on to their business forever. It's their passion. It's their baby. They can't see a time where they won't be doing what they love to do so much. But um, there's there's going to come a time, you know, if, even if the thing that comes knocking on all of our doors, death comes, how are you going to transition that, that business? And those are things that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but the conversation is necessary in order for you to be prepared, generations to be prepared, and for you to do successful succession planning. As I'm paging through your book, I see that one of the lines says, become a savvy conversationalist, and I agree with that. But what do you think is the toughest thing about a conversation? Most people is to actually listen. <laughs> I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't come across a lot of good listeners nowadays. Uh, for me, a habit that I have is actually taking notes. I, I'm very conscious of the fact that I want to give someone their time to talk. And even if there is a question that I have or a rebuttal that I want to make, I'll write it down before I interrupt them because I think in this day and age, we're just losing um, the respect for one another's time and space. And so I, I'm very conscious to do that. But if you'll notice in a lot of conversations, everybody's ready to get their point of view out, and nobody's really listening for understanding of what the other person has to say. I totally agree with you, as because I'm a talk show host by day and a podcaster by night. And it's funny mm-hmm. because my job isn't – I'm not a talk show host. I'm a talk show listener. <laughs> it's really mm. what I, it's really what I believe. Because I mean, you have to listen to a conversation in order to ask the follow up question. Unless you, of course, you have all your right. questions written out, and then you're not going to ask questions based on what you're seeing or hearing. Absolutely. You talked earlier about finding the pain. Are you in sales? Because a lot of times, when you talk to a salesperson, at least the successful ones, they're able to find the pain that the client has, and then help them to come up with a solution to fix it? Well, I think all business owners have to be in sales, and uh, regardless of what you're selling. So even you with your podcast, you know, there are other podcasts out there, but the people who listen to you or who are supposed to listen to you, you've got to sell it. You've got to market it. You've got to show them where that pain is. 
um, there's a movie and it, the name is, uh, I think it's Wolf of Wall Street. That's it. There's a part at the end where Leonardo DiCaprio is asking this guy to sell me this pen. And, you know, everybody takes the pen and they're talking about all of the features of the pen. Well, I think the answer that they came up with is, uh, hey, do you need a pen? And so someone who didn't have a pen, you didn't have to do much selling because he needed that pen. And so we have to figure out what people need, and we just have to present it to them. Not so much sell it, but just show them, hey, I have something that you need, and I'm willing to exchange it. Well, I think the guy that finally sold it was the guy that sold the line, that sold what the pen actually did for him, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a lot of conversations with entrepreneurs. That's my favorite uh person to talk with entrepreneur business and marketing are kind of the things that I enjoy doing the uh, the most and finding out the most about because I've got a mind that's always working toward that next great idea and mm. I haven't had a lot of success in some of the ideas that I've had but I've had a whole ton of ideas what makes somebody a serial entrepreneur rather than just a regular old entrepreneur I just think the number of times that you've tried it so the number of times that you've tried it, not necessarily failed or succeeded, but just the number of times that you've tried it. So um, I've had at least five different businesses. Uh, three of those businesses are still in operation. Uh, two of them uh, have either been sold or closed, but I'm going to continue to start new businesses um, until I find that sweet spot where I want to stay. And so um, I'm not, I'm not limited by people's opinions of me starting businesses in a particular industry or how many times I start. I know that I have a passion for starting a business, uh, for being a business owner, and I find joy and pleasure in that. I also find pleasure in helping other business owners, which is why I started the consulting firm, because I just had a lot of experiences, both positive and negative, and if I can use that to help another entrepreneur, it helps our economy. Um, I'm doing something that I'm passionate about, and I'm getting paid for it. So um, I love to do it. Angela, I always like to ask a couple of off-the-wall questions. So what's your most useless talent? I can still do a split. I was a cheerleader back in middle school, and I can still do a split. Can you get back up, though? It takes a few seconds, but eventually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> i got to crawl over to the table and hold myself up afterwards. I can get down, but getting back up is a problem. What's the best thing you've ever bought? My Keurig. I love it to life. It, it, just, it, it just makes my fresh coffee in record time. And I'm ready to go in the morning. What's your favorite blend of coffee? I like the blonde from uh, Starbucks. They have a blonde roast now. It's delicious. I like the blonde from Starbucks, too, but my wife doesn't like that I like it. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, 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 is, is it okay to laugh when you're supposed to be serious? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I love to laugh. It's like a medicine. Angela D. Mueller is my guest on the uh, podcast this this week. Uh, Angela, how do people find your book? Uh, they can go to Amazon and look at 2020 Vision for Your Life. They can look up my last name. There are not many Mueller's, M-E-A-L-E-R. And they can also go to AngelaMueller.com. It takes them right over to my Facebook page. And from there, you can order uh, the hard copy of the book or the uh, electronic version. The BSing with Bob Schmidt podcast is brought to you by Orange Computer. Find them online at orangecomputerlax.com. This has been another podcast for hire.com production.